This year's 11th annual TKAA tournament was canceled due to the weather, but the party and the raffle still continue. To add some entertainment, they had a few of us get up and do a question and answer hour. The panel was Drew Camp, Jeff Little, myself, Lee Williams, William Rogowski, Rob Choi, and on the mic was Tom Maddock. And really, we've got a couple very accomplished freshwater anglers. We've got Jeff Little and Drew Camp. Uh, for anybody that's followed them, they definitely are skilled. On the left side here, your right side, we've got Kevin, Lee, William, and Rob. Um, and it's just going to be an open forum. So what I'd like is to just ask for anybody who has questions, start posing them. We'll, I'll moderate. I'll make sure that people get heard. If you're in the back room, just come to one of the doorways, wave your hand. Um, when you ask a question, I'll go ahead and repeat the question so everyone can hear. And then whoever it's directed to or just open, we'll let them answer. So we will open up the floor to anybody that has questions. You can ask them what their favorite color underwear is. <laughs> Getting close. <laughs> what's the, what's the, best, the best innovation, the newest innovation or whatever that you've seen come along since your, your early days? The kayaks forming to the anglers. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, the biggest. Man. Oh, we got to ask the question. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Patience is not a virtue. <laughs> the question was directed to Kevin, and it was basically what is the best innovation that he has seen come through since he started? So we have all right. Yeah, the kayaks turning towards the anglers, really forming towards that. It's the whole the whole division towards that. Just that that in, in a big in a big sense, that's really um, that's really what I've seen. Because you know, when they were first they were just sit on top, you know, just paddle out recreational looking. And now like that. I mean, look at it. It's amazing. So yeah, that's the biggest thing that I've seen. Anybody else on the panel wanna chime in, even though it was just directed to Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> All right. In the back. Hey, can you talk a little bit about uh, cold weather gear and some or some on a low budget, some on a high budget, what you guys use and why you chose that kind of gear? The question was just basically what the recommendations are for cold weather gear um, for both budget and You've got an endless budget. So Lee, you've got an endless budget. What do you use? I mean, we use Kotec here now, but when I started out, if you really need cold weather gear, we started out using neoprene waders, like boot-footed neoprene waders is what I started out with. And as long as you can get them big enough to put clothes on, you know, use the right layers underneath of them and keep warm, being warm and comfortable is really, you know, we've been comfortable since we started. And it, it you know, eventually evolved from neoprene to breathable waders. And the breathable, I mean, the neoprenes, the problem with that was they wouldn't breathe out. So it would sweat in, in your neoprenes and we get freezing and I ain't good with the cold. And so that was a big issue. So when we graduated to breathables, that was, that let us stay out there for a long time in layers. I want to, can we, before we get into gear, I think also one of the most important things, especially in cold water, is we know how to get back in your time immediately. Yeah, yeah. Without that, I mean, don't even, yeah. don't bother going out, please. Yeah. Um, whatever you have. So, first and foremost. And that's practicing. That's going out and practicing. Get, get, going out of your boat and getting back on. You know, just get it where it's muscle memory. So when you're in shock, as soon as that freezing water hits you, you don't think about it. You just get in the boat. Fall out of the boat, flip the boat all the way over, both ways. Just, <laughs> both ways are going to happen. <laughs> Another thing with like the low budget, is if you're going to be using waders, uh, definitely want to try top something with gaskets. Really going to help you uh, avoid water getting inside. Um, a wading belt is huge, and the biggest thing to tie them all together that I found. Um, some people may disagree, but is a PFD on top of all of that. That PFD is kind of that glue that holds that dry top and waders and wading belt together. 
I'm going to put my two cents in on this. We are actually discussing it at this table this evening, and uh, the the word relief zipper is huge. <laughs> Thank you. For a number of reasons, but we'll talk about you know the obvious. What do you do if you have a pair of of just regular neoprene or breathable waders? What do you do when you have to go? The first thing you do. Take someone, someone at the table said, you take off your gloves. I'm like, well, yeah, there, there's that. But you also have to take off your white vest. And you have to take off the top jacket. And then you have to pull your, you know, your waders down here. So you've removed the thing that's going to save your life. You've tied something around your ankle so that if you fall over, I mean, it's just a bad deal. And if you have the relief zipper, it's, you know, it, it goes quick and you get back to fishing. Go ahead. Step one is beach Right. Right. Um, the other thing is, though, that you lose a lot of your heat if you start stripping off layers in order in order to relieve yourself. And, I mean, I fish the Susquehanna River, you know, as long as it's not solid and uh, being able to stay. And that's the thing, man. Y'all, if you fish down here, he ain't from here. He's from here. He's a man, man. He fishes when it's like February and it's frozen over here. He's like fishing as long as there's night ice on this river. As long as there's not there, the river is. That's crazy. <laughs> and so, we don't know nothing about cold weather. So listen to what he's saying here. That and having a, uh, a bail bag, having a, a dry bag with everything you need to easily uh, to start a fire to get yourself warm back up having that you know set of clothes to change into because if you're if you're wet you're never going to warm up so what you call it a bail bag uh, a bail bag or just you know, yeah just having a kit with all the dry clothes that you can change into and a fire starting kit that you have multiple ways of starting a fire um i'll tell you when you get hypothermic Something as simple as flicking the little flint on a lighter is really difficult. So you want it to be something easy like the, the little trigger things that for uh, lighting your grill. You know, a couple different ways of starting fire would be a good thing. So the nice kept the paper starting the car was a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that and everybody mentioned layers up here. So while you have your dry top on, you don't want to just have a hoodie on under it. All right, the cotton hoodie you're going to sweat is going to make you cold. Make sure you layer up correctly, you know, a nice Under Armour, like warm gear layer. Fleece is always like number one. You don't want to wear cotton, you want to have fleece on. And then put your dry top on, you know. You don't want to just throw a t-shirt, hoodie, dry top. You know, you want to actually think about this because you got to have that. If you do start to sweat, you will get cold no matter how dry you are. No All right, other questions? Or William. Do you like to rig your gulp with the tail up? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the question was... <laughs> Honestly, Mark, gulp's gold. It works. Put it on the hood. Point fine. taken. <laughs> Great question. Thing. How many days of the, of the year are they spending on the water? Alright, so the question was, how many days of the, wear, of the year do each of you spend on the water. You want to just go down the line? We'll start with Rob. Now. 364 and a half. Not three years ago, <laughs> now. <laughs> Jenny's not here, right? Yeah, the front people know me. I got a wife and kids, so I don't, not nearly as money. I still do a lot, and I'm very lucky. I can't really give you a number. I mean, preferably once a week, maybe, once every other week. You can tell us how big your fish are without measuring them. I think you can tell us how many days you're on the water. <laughs> They don't get all at the boat. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm single and I live in one of the best fisheries in the country. So I do probably between 100 and 130, 140 days a year, uh, whether that's an hour trip or all day. Billy fishes twice that much. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I don't know, there's 
two weekends a year, and I probably fish almost both days every weekend of mine, and then a couple yeah. of days during the week if the weather is good. So I don't know, well over 100. Well over 100, probably 130, 140 days. Just, I also live on the beach, so if I decide to walk back behind my house and take a couple casts or throw the cast net, that's fishing, so. Um, a lot. <laughs> when I was doing the uh, expert chase, I was doing I was doing a fishing log, and I was so I was logging all the stuff down, so I got a really accurate number for those years, and I was doing 800 hours a year on the water. Um, that's cut in half since I started doing video. Once I started video, that took a, took about half that, and now I'm doing probably at least two days on the water, and then you know uh, maybe an afternoon or something. But this year I've been doing a lot of camping, so I've been going out over a couple nights a week, and going to Eastern Shore and hunt reds and doing that stuff. So, you know, it's a little bit different every year. Um, I've kind of gotten to a groove where I just like chasing reds, and that's all I go after. So when they're here, I really go obsessed, like right now, right now, I'm bugging. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I think somewhere between 70 and 80. Um, I know that, you know, when, when my wife was expecting our, our first son, a bunch of my buddies said, oh, you're not going to be able to fish as much. Uh, and that was true for a couple of years, but now I'm getting that back in spades because they get with me. And I'm, I'm fishing, you know, pretty much both days of the weekend because of the day before it's with me. Good excuse. <laughs> and um, it may not seem like it, but I actually have to go to school. So. <laughs> school year and between sports and school I can only get like one day a week it's only Saturday but during the summertime about three four times a week maybe more if the weather allows. And there's days you called it sick at work. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Alright other questions? So you guys all target specific species and, and you're good at the species you target. Do you ever just go out just to fish and say whatever bites bites? You do a lot of, in the videos and the pictures, specialized targeted fishing. Do you ever just go out just to fish, or is it always targeted? All right, so to paraphrase, I think the question is just, do you go out with a plan in mind of the species you're targeting, or are there ever times you just go out to fish to fish, right? Yeah, basically. Why don't we start this way this time and go back? All right, for me, I, I go out fishing for a certain fish. Now, earlier in that week when I'm preparing, I might decide, you know, hey, I want to go catch crappie this week, but then I'm going to catch crappie. I'm not going out there and saying, oh, maybe I'll catch a bass, maybe I'll catch a catfish, you know. I, I like to plan how long I'm going to catch, and then I target that fish. I'm always pretty much looking for a specific uh, species, but it changes. Um, depending on what, what video I'm, I'm working on. Uh, that being said, there are certain lures that I'll use that are, are really fun because you never know what you're gonna catch. Uh, fishing a blade bait in the winter time on a reservoir down in, you know, 50 feet down in a creek channel or a reservoir, you don't know what you're gonna pull up. It could be a you know, large mouth, a small mouth, a walleye, a, a perch. Uh, that, that's one of those fun things to fish because you never know what's coming up. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I mean, especially this year. This year. Um, I, I, I really haven't. I, I used to, like when I go we call backyard fishing, go out there and just like just cast around. I haven't done any of that this year. I've just been going either Eastern Shore or to the bridge and I've maybe targeted spade fish twice the rest of the Reds all year. It's just. And it's not that I'm like, you know, I have to catch rain, it's just that's really what I love to do. I mean, it's, it is kind of, yes, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather go to Eastern Shore and know what I'm getting into, exactly where I'm going I'm to make. I'm not going to make a cast until I see one, rather than going into my backyard and make a main cast and maybe catch one. That should be right now. It's not saying next year I'm not going to do that. But this year, it was definitely that. I was just all obsessed and still am. <laughs> Other than taking my niece to the pond and putting Worms on one rod and corn on the other. No, I mean I always am fishing for a specific species. So, I mean, pretty much the same answer. <laughs> when I fish this year, um, not on the fly, I really target what I'm going after. But if I'm out on the kayak with a fly rod, it's 
any game, anything. Uh, Egg roll, bass, crop eucher, unless I'm going after car, then I yell at the cousin. <laughs> the as far as I can throw when they hit my car flies. <laughs> Got my stuff, yard sale, 
Um, I get back in, and my buddy didn't know what was going on. He's like, man, I'm sorry. You must be angry. And I'm like, you're damn right I'm angry. I lost that fish. <laughs> so that is 23 inches, though, right? I actually, I just looked at it, and it was probably 27. <laughs> I get a lot of fish stories, so I'm just going to narrow it down to the last uh, I don't know, stories in the last year or so. Uh, last January, um, I'm on Facebook and hadn't been on the water in a while. And you know, you hear everyone griping about cabin fever, haven't been out, and I just kind of offhandedly put down a comment, "Screw it, I'm going." And it was about you know 8:30 at night, and that's what I did. Is I got got in the car, drove to Baltimore, put my kayak in the Patapsco, and 11:30 at night caught a 45 and a half inch striper, and had to crunch the rice to get to it. And uh, you know <laughs> that was my favorite day last year. Kevin so. lost the guy in the trip.
at the ramp, and these fish were pretty uh, skittish. And I hear this boat coming behind me. I look back, and this guy's on a tall motor throwing his spinner bait. And these car is falling all over the place. And he's just rolling all around through here. He's scaring all the fish. And I haven't really caught many. And he looks at me, and he's like, what are, what, what are you fishing for? I'm like, I'm fishing for these garlic around here. Like, these aren't gar. These are the biggest bass I have ever seen. <laughs> I've seen gar before. These are some big bass. <laughs> and it, it, I was, I had to look, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, man. This, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and so yeah, that's, that's my, you gotta be kidding me moment. <laughs> Any other questions? I got one. Go. All right, forest first. Then, uh, you one? All right, we'll get you next, then Joe. I know I've been a part of it, but uh, what's the most embarrassing thing you've ever done in your kayak? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Forrest asked what was the most embarrassing thing you've done in your kayak? Start with Drew. Alright, Drew. <laughs> I gotta think. Oh, you gotta pick one out? Alright, this one's uh, pretty bad. I was, I was fishing, um, I was bass fishing, and I I'm pretty skinny and my bathing suits don't really fit well and so I have to tie them really tight. But throughout the day they come untied. So I'm fishing and uh, I'm in this cove. I'm throwing a, I'm throwing a top water and this bass hits and I, I lay into this bass and my pants fall right off. <laughs> so now I'm fighting this bass, my bathing suits around my ankle and this, this other guy comes to the So it, it relates to taking my kids fishing, and I don't know, it's just a simple thing that happens. That, uh, you know, I was at a, a reservoir up in Maryland, and I have my kids, one's still in diapers, and the other one's a toddler, kind of running around. And I can see that there's a line of, you know, of trailers getting ready to use the, the, uh, the launch. And I park it there, and I tell, you know, the older one, Sawyer, you watch your brother, don't go anywhere. And I run for the car and I start bringing it down. I get the kids situated, and I'm, you know, I'm there with the, the SUV on the ramp. And some guy walks up. He's like, "Dude, your boat's like out there." <laughs> so my kids are, are, you know, in their car seats, snugged away, and I'm like, "Okay, I guess I'm swimming for it." So I probably swam from here to the corner of the room and back with the with the guy. Yeah, I mean, I did. I get close to the same thing with a bass boat. One day I. Went to launch the bass boat when I bass fish all the time. Just dropped it in the lake. Well, the first time I dropped it in the lake, because I was waiting for a buddy, I was going to pull it up on to the shore and wait for him. And I did, and when I walked back down to it, it was full of water, because I forgot to put the plug in. <laughs> so I put it back on the trailer, emptied it out, dropped it back in the water, it started off fine, you know, on the trailer. Dropped the trailer the rest of the way back in the water without attaching the rope to the tongue of the trailer, and <laughs> so across the creek it went. So I was stripping down, and I hadn't got completely naked like Drew yet, but I was down there by my underwear, and an old guy pulled into the parking lot to go straight for fishing, and he took me to get my boat, but not a kayak story. Anyway. Uh, so when I first started kayak fishing, uh, I got off of Richmond, so I started uh, shad fishing, which is a little close to my house, and, um, when the shad was running. Um, anybody who knows Aunt Carol Landing knows it's pretty much a zoo. And uh, I, I, one day that afternoon, I, I got the okay from the wife, so I, I got all my stuff, rushed down, get in line to the lawn, basically, because there's a bunch of boats. I finally get to where I'm supposed to be. I get my kayak out, put all my stuff in it. People waiting for me. I sit in my kayak, I look for my paddle, and it's not there. So, that's a little embarrassing. I, 
pull the kayak back out, and wait, make everybody else wait. Um, on, on a different note, the, uh, a little embarrassing. Don't be weird, but uh, last week. Y'all know. Or last night. No, last week. No, uh, no they didn't. This is. Everybody obviously on Asian, right? It's no. <laughs> I don't think I can beat it. All right, I'll tell a little story then. All right. <laughs> All right. There and then we'll get Joe in a second. Yeah, can you, uh, we talked about it a little earlier. I thought it was pretty interesting about the weight limit. You have your kids, the teacher's kids, pattern skills. All right, so the question was just how does Jeff teach yeah. his kids paddling skills? So if you follow me on Facebook, you probably saw the, the picture from last week. And it's the end of my arm in a football, and kid one here in a kayak, kid there in a kayak, and whitewater shoot here and a whitewater shoot here. And we're playing football fetch, okay? So it's, you know, as soon as it's hugged the ball, I'm chucking it over in the whitewater there. They're racing after it to, you know, Basically, if you bring it back to me, you get a point, and we start over. Um, <clears throat> the younger kid, Cooper, won, because he's more aggressive in the wide water. He's totally fearless. He'll just dive, you know, head first into the fastest wet water if he sees the ball. If I were to try to sit there and do formal instruction with him, saying, this is how you do an eddy turn, this is how you do ferry, this is, you know, these are the paddling skills you need, you know, they would just shrug and say, whatever, daddy, we're gonna catch some fish. But doing it in that format, they're learning all those skills. So. I thought it was pretty interesting, because we all have young kids or grandkids or whatever, to teach them that and skills instead of putting them in a class, <clears throat> doing something active. I, I know this much um, in terms of teaching kids anything. Um, you know, I've taught a lot of people uh, to kayak fish in rivers, and I've taught a lot of, you know, paddling skills to a lot of people, but there are certain things I can't teach my kid, and it's just because I'm their father, and that's what more I look to people like Juan Veru or Jed or, or any of my buddies that I fish with. If we're on a hot, you know, uh, topwater bite, and I can't keep my kid from swinging every time it blows up on his buzz bait, I've learned to not tell him that. I don't say anything, but I'll go over to Juan and be like, hey, can you tell him to quit pulling it away from those bats? And he'll come over and tell him, and then I'll get it. So it, it, it really does speak, though, to it, it takes all of us to bring up kids in, in this sport. So definitely helping out kids that way is, is rewarding, but it, you know, it takes all of us. Thanks for asking. Right, Woods embarrassed to ask his question, so Chuck. Your dream kayak trip, what species would you target and where would you go? All right, so the question is, if you had your dream kayak trip, what would, what would be your target, target species, species and where, and where would, would you go? You want to start with It would either be down um, Patagonia for Golden Dorado, uh, the Costa Rica for rooster fish, or actually what would probably you be the most- You can pick one, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, uh, which would, would be the flats for permit? Permit. Permit. It's kind of weird for me because like, I actually really, really love fishing in Virginia. It's like, I love it here. And, um, as far as dream fish, I have to say it's actually a Virginia target for me. Um, other than that, probably, you know, Florida for whatever. <laughs> I want to catch Brandon, please. <laughs> uh, I think the med for the bluefin tunas they catch right close to the shore on the lures. I think that would be absolutely amazing throwing topwater poppers and subsurface baits for bluefin tunas in the med. Damn, that's great. <laughs> mine, mine has always been recent fish. Uh, uh, 
they're close. They remind me of a, a red with like a, a you know a dolphin tail. It's like they remind me of that. So it's like it, it's an exotic species, and, but in in where you catch them, I'm familiar with it, so I know I'll be able to experience the fight kind of the way I would like to. You know what I mean? And, it's what deep. It's when you should, you know, running off. Um, I've heard they run you up on the beach and all that. That's like beach stuff. fishing, not not the ledge fishing. Right, beach right. Fishing. Yeah, yeah. So like in like you know, Costa Rica, it's not Costa Rica, but yeah, Baja and stuff like that. Right down there. Catch them, catch them, catch them right down there. Right in the surf, right in the surf. Right yeah. surf. So that that reach of fish down there is what I want to do. So my dream trip I've already I've already done. It's just been you know many years since I've done it. Uh, since having kids. Um, it, and that's really just to to disappear into the New River for a week at a time and sleep on islands and eat Chef Fuerte and just, I don't know, just, but just having that, you know, uninterrupted week-long trip where you're, you know, you're just living out there. Alright, and then uh, my dream trip would definitely be a uh, sailfish or a white bone out of the kayak. I think that billfish are totally awesome and I never even attempted to try to catch one, so I think one of those other kayaks would just be amazing. Rudy Hamlet, horse croaker, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, you have a question? This is kind of for Jeff. Uh, my son loves to go out with me uh, as much as he can, I and mean, then he hates it. So there's times that he loves to go out, times he hates it. So what are some of the things you can do? with your sons to really get them engaged to really kind of want to get Well, the... So what you're saying is just, how do you keep your kids engaged with not swinging back and forth between loving fishing and hating fishing and keeping them engaged and yeah, wanting to go out? And even on the water, you think you get, sometimes they'll get bored because sometimes it's, you know, we're not catching anything, contrary to my picture saying. But sometimes, sometimes we get bored. Or when you're at shows and it's going to hold still and you're taking your head off. Give me a real spin. Go ahead, Jeff. So my, well, you're looking for specific activities, and, and I can give you a list of things that we bring, you know, the uh, the scuba mast and the snorkel, and, you know, obviously we bring the football, and we always have a lot of food. Um, but I'd say my kids don't always love fishing, but they always love the river. And, and that, that's just important. I mean, you know, I give them a long leash when we're out there, you know, whether they want to, you know, shove the nose of the kayak into a, into a hole. And, like, my youngest one does that, and he's never really been subjected or even seen whitewater paddling, and he's doing enders. And I'm like, where did you pick this up? And it's intuitive. But, you know, you, you take them to the, you know, to the places that you love, and they're going to figure out the ways in which they love it as much as you. It just may be different. And it may not always be fishing, but, you know, my kids are always up for going on the river. And, and sometimes they'll be like, I don't want to fish today, Daddy. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And I lead by example, and I'll catch some fish, and then I'll turn around and, and they have a rod in their hand and they're doing it. Um, that's not always the case. But you, you really do need to generate your own list of alternate activities, things that they would think is interesting, you know, find ways to teach them, you know, hey, this is a hell of a night, this is a mattaton, this is, let's, you know, let's put the mask on and, and muck through this, this grass bed and see what's in there. And they'll pull up stuff and say, what's that? Oh, that's a uh, dragonfly larvae. So, you know, you're gonna have to generate your own list, but there's stuff to do out there because kids are, are just, you know, they are fascinated with nature. Just let them lead a little bit. Right, so we got time for one or two more questions, so. Yeah, I've seen a couple of things that I thought were strange. Uh, this year I, I caught, and I see online other people caught, small gag grouper, and I caught a Jack Travell, a small Jack Travell at Rudy Jetty, and I see somebody caught a big one with online. And then, so I wonder if, what you think about, I mean, is the fishery changing? I mean, do you think this can turn into a, a big grouper fishery, or are they all going to disappear, or is this some kind of anomaly? Or what? We've, we've had that a couple Yeah, I thought we were like six years ago. Yeah. You don't want to do this, right? No, we're doing it. So, this, uh, uh, so your question is just seeing the changes. Yeah, with, yeah, grouper, Jack Rebell, yeah. are they here to stay? <laughs> uh, so others, like southern species coming 
sun getting into our waters? Yeah. What do you all think is the cause of that? And are they going to stick around? It's, we've, we've been catching those off and on for the last uh, 10 years, yeah. like the small ones. Um, it seems to be that they don't, they're not just becoming a fish here. I don't think it's warm enough to, to, to keep them here. It's like summertime, maybe the big ones are coming up here or whatever. But it doesn't seem like they've been caught here enough that we would have already been kind of catching some larger ones. So it doesn't seem like that. Uh, Jack Sanford is coming up and moving here now. Yeah, about seven or eight years ago, I think it was, Wavy TV 10 put a big thing, like a 30 second section on their news about tunas migrating out of the bay. And it's a giant school of Jack and Bells just swimming in a huge circle between like the third and fourth island on the way out. We also get false out before we're inside. We get many fish here too. And actually, we had talked about this, uh, Lee and I, about one of the things that we thought uh, currents. We're having definitely different currents that are coming into the bay, the Gulf Stream slowing down, getting eddies. And I think a lot of that newer, warmer water, uh, we have a lot of oceanic water uh, right before this flow that was in the bay. Um, I think it's the currents that are definitely bringing so, so maybe like El Nino changes every year, right? Maybe the Gulf Stream changes yeah, I mean, a little bit every year. And yeah. I've got a friend that runs a coral shop. Yeah. I've got a friend that, friend that runs a coral shop, and he goes quite often down to Hatteras and Ovico and swims out on the inshore wrecks and catches Caribbean tangs and French angelfish, such like that. So those fish get caught up in the currents and move up north of the Gulf Stream and come off in the eddies. So, you know, there's no telling why a certain gag grouper is here, but we've been catching them for years. There were way more this year. Yeah. All right, time for like one more question. So, so before you guys were experts and you're learning and trying different things, how long would you spend on a spot or a certain lure before you moved on to something else and decided to try a different strategy? All right, so the question is, on their road to becoming an expert, what would they, or how much time would they spend on a specific spot, specific lure, before they moved on to the next thing to master, right? Or if that wasn't working, try something else at the same time. Okay. The learning process. Start with how much information you have on that spot to start with. Uh, if you, like, when we started striper fishing, we were around boats that were catching striper left and right. So it took us a little bit to catch up with the way they were doing it, but if you're in a spot and you're watching people catch fish, it's a whole lot easier to stay more confident and keep working at what you're working at. Uh, a lot of us are type A personalities, so uh, for me, I like Rob said earlier, very goal oriented. I would not give up on a presentation or a lure until I knew I were number one, it was never coming back out of a kayak with me again, or I caught something from it. And then that helped me narrow down what I was willing to throw, and I would just perfect it every trip. Um, obviously, we have trips where the journey, but it, it took me years to figure out this is what I want to use actually know why I wanted to use it. I'm pretty stubborn when it comes to especially a lot of inshore stuff or things that are a little more pressure sensitive and weather sensitive I think. I don't give up on things threes easily so it's weird it's almost like you find a confidence bait and, and you want to use it to such a degree that when your buddy is tearing them up on something else you still don't want to switch and it's bad sometimes, so I mean, um, it, it takes a while, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm stubborn and I stick with it for a while. Well, kind of, that was kind of a way to answer that question. I was kind of thinking of how long it took you, like, years wise to learn something before you would move to somewhere else. Um, like, I spent two years at HRPT before I went anywhere else. You know, I spent you know first year learning how to paddle inside, and then like, and then I moved there and slowly worked my way out of the bridge. So I was learning paddle skills and learning how to fish there and learning my, myself in the boat and all the all the conditions that were given to me there, and that, that helped a lot. So I learned there before I moved out to Chesapeake Bay, time. So I worked my way up. So that's kind of part of the question, but. Okay. All right.
as in the lures, I'm pretty stubborn too. I'll, I'll stick with one thing, especially if I know it works. Even if it's not working that day, I'm still going to do it. Yeah. And kind of a, lot of, a lot of the fishing we do is sight fishing too. If you see a fish turn and run away from your lure, then I'm going to change. <laughs> so, we're about to get schooled by Jeff a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tom's going to kick us out soon though because of the brownies I need to on. No, 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 those wings. We're going to get kicked out soon when he's coming back for his brownies. Here. <laughs> 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 I'm back. I think part of the, the thrill of fishing is is learning something new, having success. It's something that, you know, <clears throat> that last trip out you weren't good at, and this trip you've, you've made that breakthrough, you've figured something out. Um, it, I'm taking your question as a, as a, as asking, hey, how do you, how do you speed up that learning curve? How do you, how do you get to the next level? Um, and for me, it's really about finding mentors, finding someone who knows and I'll use, um, I'm going to pick a specific one, uh, suspending dirt bait fish in cold water for river smallmouth. Um, you know, there's, I'm really good at it, but there was a point where, where I would fish with guys that I'd drag a tube on the bottom of the river and catch one fish to their three or four. And it frustrated me to no end. If I actually, like, tried it, and caught some smaller fish. My buddies were catching bigger ones, and it just got totally frustrated with it and gave up and, and let it go for another year. Uh, and then came back to it the next year. And you know, it, you do get, build some confidence watching other people uh, have some success in front of you. You build some success, maybe, or you build some confidence, maybe just seeing trip reports, knowing that it can work. But ultimately, you just have to do it long enough that you get your first big fish doing whatever different technique it is. I mean, it was it was that way for me with um, you know, like testing bigger for striper. You know, I only picked that up like two years ago, and I watched a bunch of you know, I read a Sean Kimbrough book on it and learned how to do it. But it wasn't until I had you know that first 28 inch striper at the end of my line that I'm like, okay. Now I believe in it. So you should have looked at Kevin's website, man. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you, you learn it from mentors, and sometimes your mentors are these these people that write books and, and do videos. But sometimes it's just you know one of your fishing buddies that knows a little bit more than you do, or you know. So you got to look around. You got to look and see. Hey. He may have one little piece of the puzzle <clears throat> that I don't have that I'm going to try and learn from him in, in advance. Of it. And I'm pretty much the same way Jeff was. So when I first started bass fishing about three years ago, I had four lures that I knew how to use, and that's all I wanted to use. Uh, one day, wintertime fishing with Richie Beckele, I know a lot of you guys know him, uh, he schooled me with a spinnerbait. I'd never thrown one before. And that set me off on, all right, I'm going to learn every lure I can and how to use it. So then I started fishing a jig for bass. And I spent two weeks just fishing that. It's all I brought out with me. I learned how to use it. That was in my arsenal. I checked it off. Then a spinnerbait. I only fished with a spinnerbait. Learned how to use it. Checked it all. Then I started a swimbait fishing. I only used a swimbait. Checked it all. So now I've built up where I can throw. I can look at the water. I know what the temperature is going to be, where the bass are going to be. I can know, all right, this is the lure I'm going to use. If not, I know how to use it. And um, when a new lure comes out, I'll only throw it. Uh, I spent a lot of time this summer throwing a seven inch swim bait because I thought, man, if I'm going to catch a bass, it's going to be great. And so I spent three weeks, and that's all I had with me was just seven inch swim baits. And I had to fish them everywhere I knew where bass were going to be. And eventually I started catching them on it. So now I've checked that off. Uh, now it's the Alabama where we've been throwing that a lot lately and um, I'm starting to get used to it. So that's going to be my next one to check off. So if you want to learn a lure, just fish with that lure. All right? Don't go, all right, they're not eating this. I'm going to switch to one and it works. Fish it until you catch something with it because then you'll gain confidence in it.
All right, so that ends our Q&A. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming up to the uh, stage and being part of the panel. These guys aren't just great anglers. They're really stewards of the sport. And I think they deserve a round of applause. I mean, I got nothing. You guys, you guys <laughs>